Well, friends, on most Easter Sundays, we draw our text from the Gospel of Luke and the familiar story of how at dawn on that first Easter morning, the women followers of Jesus arrive at his tomb to prepare his body for what they believe will be a burial, only to find the tomb empty and an angel telling them that Jesus has risen from the dead. Frightened and amazed, the women rush off to tell the disciples what they've learned. But this morning, we'll pick up the story a little later on that same day. The women have returned home and told the other disciples what they saw at the tomb, and all of them are confused and, and afraid, unsure what to do or believe. And here begins the story of the disciple that we've come to know as Doubting Thomas. So from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 19 through 29. When it was evening on that first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw him. But Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the others when Jesus came. Later, the disciples told him, we've seen him, he has risen. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my hand in the wound in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and again stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Come, see the marks in my, on my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. As Thomas did so, he answered him, My Lord and my God, and Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I once uh, heard someone suggest that long, long ago and all seen all-knowing God included the story of doubting Thomas in the Bible because God could foresee that one day there would be a clan of people called Unitarians. <laughs> and that rather than deal with all their questions and doubts and, and skepticism about the resurrection after the fact, God anticipated them and just wrote the Unitarians right into the story in the person of Thomas, right? Of all the disciples, Thomas, I believe, was the one Unitarian Universalist. Why? Because he is the one who needs to see for himself in order to believe. That sounds like us. He's the one who doubts and wonders and sometimes asks difficult questions. That sounds like us. And in the end, he's the one who gets a little scolding from Jesus, and maybe that sounds like us too. <laughs> but in all seriousness, put yourself in Thomas's shoes. Imagine that one of the people that you love most in the world has died suddenly. When you met him, he changed your life forever. You gave up everything to follow him. He was your teacher, your rabbi. You loved him like a brother. Then one day, the authorities murder him right before your eyes. 
And just like that, the one you love is gone. All that has given your life meaning and purpose is taken away. So you go off and you just grieve by yourself. You want to be all alone. Notice that Thomas wasn't with the other disciples on that first Easter day. And when you do return, your friends are acting strange and they're telling you this unbelievable story. You want to believe, but surely they're just deluded by their grief. After all, people don't rise from the dead. But your friends insist and all you can say to them is, well, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, sometimes... Not always, but sometimes, our doubt serves as a kind of defense mechanism, protecting us, keeping our hearts from being broken again. Sometimes the thing we doubt is the thing we most desire, but dare not hope for. I know I'm never gonna meet anyone well, I'm probably not going to get that job. Protecting ourselves. Now, what happens next in the story is, for me, one of the most dramatic moments in the Bible. For Thomas finally does come face to face with the risen Christ, with the very thing he doubts, which is also the thing that he most longs for. And he gets a good look at the wounds that he wanted to see. And friends, my vision of this scene is forever and indelibly marked by the artist Caravaggio's portrayal of the scene in his painting, The Incredulity of Thomas. Now I'm going to ask Cade if he could please put that image up on the screen for us of the Caravaggio painting. Is it up there yet? Do I get a... Okay, great, great. Caravaggio, the Italian Baroque master, uses sharp contrasts of light and dark to heighten the drama of the moment, drawing our attention to the open wound in Jesus' torso. We see Jesus taking Thomas' wrist and guiding his hand to the site of the wound. Thomas bends over and leans in until the wound is right at eye level and he can look directly in. But above all, we see Thomas's finger, not just pointing to the wound, mind you, but actually inside Jesus' flesh, inside his body, probing the wound. This isn't a cursory glance. This is an examination, as if in that wound, Thomas believes he will find answers to all the questions he has about what happened. And what I'm left with in seeing this painting is an appreciation for just how fearless Thomas is in his pursuit of the truth. Caravaggio seems to be saying to us, facing our doubts, whatever they may be, is not for the squeamish or the faint of heart. If you need to see for yourself, then you better be willing to go there. And the other thing I find moving about, about the painting is the intimacy of this scene. Jesus and Thomas and two other disciples are, are huddled together like in a, in a group hug. And rather than keeping him at a cool distance, Thomas's doubt draws him close, very close. It's his need to see for himself that brings him into intimate contact with the object of his doubt and his love. At long last, Thomas has seen what he needed to see. At long last, Thomas has experienced for himself a resurrection. Finally, he can sing his Alleluia. You know, I think there's a lot of doubt, a, a lot of confusion these days about the relationship between doubt and faith. It's almost as if we've divided into two camps. On the one hand, there are those who, who say that doubt, well, is a sign of weakness, 
that to be strong in our convictions, we must banish our doubts and believe, come hell or high water. That's what, that's what faith is. And perhaps in response to this position, there are others who believe just as strongly that, that doubt is evidence of courageous conviction. They wear their doubt loud and proud, like a badge of courage, or even, let's face it, sometimes a chip on our shoulder, practically daring another to knock it off. One camp seems as allergic to belief as the other is to doubt. What Thomas's story suggests to me is that doubt and faith are not these polar opposites that they can be different moments or, or stages on the same journey. Rather than shutting us down, our doubts, questions, wonderings can spark a curiosity that launches our spiritual journey and that eventually leads us to whatever it is we do claim as truth. Just as Thomas fearlessly probed Jesus' open wound, we too probe the questions and mysteries of our lives, seeking answers, seeking that which our conscience and our heart can claim as life-giving truth. Doubt, then, is neither a sign of weakness nor a badge of honor. It's simply a gift, a gift that, can, that used well can lead us toward truth and understanding and wisdom, a gift that can lead us finally to our own full-throated, whole-hearted, alleluia. Now friends, like Thomas, I too have doubted the resurrection. And yet there are a few things for which I've longed for more. I'm not speaking of the literal and bodily resurrection of Christ, though the Easter story is richly resonant for me. What I have simultaneously doubted and longed for is a lived experience of resurrection in my own life. I remember some years back, I found myself in a dark February. My spirit was cast down, my heart was heavy with grief, and as I looked around, the barren winter landscape seemed to confirm everything my soul was feeling. I doubted that what felt to me like a dead end could ever become a new beginning. In order to believe, I needed to see for myself. And so when Lent came that February, I set myself a Lenten discipline. Every day from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday, I would forego the bus, the train, the, the Uber, and instead walk the same path to and from work every day, each day noticing, looking closely for signs of life returning to the earth that winter and spring. In February, there wasn't much to see. The world was cold and gray, the trees bare, but before long, green shoots began to push up from the ground. So bold, so courageous. Tender buds formed on the branches. It began slowly. First, the purple crocus, the Lenten orchid, then the yellow of daffodil and forsythia. The birds came back with their song. The buds on the trees softened and swelled, bursting into color. The purple plum tree, the snow white pear, the pinkish white of the cherry blossoms. I know it happens every year, and it's happening right now. But that year, I needed to see it for myself, up close and personal. And it worked. 
the walking, the reflecting, the noticing. By the time Easter arrived, I was feeling better. I was ready to believe again. On Easter Sunday, I was able to sing a full-throated Alleluia. For many years, the late Reverend Peter Gomes preached across the street at Harvard's Memorial Church. And Reverend Gomes liked to say that Easter is not a debate. <laughs> it's an experience. And you don't have to die to have the experience of resurrection, he said. Life before death is really what it's all about. That's the resurrection I've longed for and sometimes doubted. Ultimately, it's the resurrection I've learned to have some faith in. Not because someone told me, not because the Bible said so, but because over and over, I've seen it with my own eyes, in my own life, in the life of the people I serve. I wish for all of us this morning this experience of new life. This experience that I speak of was once beautifully captured, I believe, by, by one noted New England Unitarian who summed it up in a poem with which I'll close this morning. These words from E.E. E. Cummings. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and love and wings and of the gay, great happening, illimitably earth. How, how should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any lifted from the no of all nothing, human merely being, doubt, unimaginable you. Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are opened. Alleluia and amen.